Well, and we have uh, 59 participants with us. So welcome everybody. This is fantastic. Um, it's a few minutes after three o'clock. So we'll go ahead and get started with our Wisdom from the Field uh, webinar. Um, I'm Keith Anderson and I'm the Associate for Digital Content for Lifelong Learning at Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, and I'm joined by Angela Nelson and Sybil Macbeth in this webinar about rebooting Advent. So um, apparently October is not too early to start talking about Advent because we have so many people here with us uh, today. Um, just a, a little bit about uh, where this comes to you from and what our format will be. Uh, this is brought to you by Lifelong Learning at Virginia Theological Seminary uh, and part of our uh, Building Faith uh, website a set of resources, uh, especially around uh, well, all kinds of resources, but especially around liturgical seasons. So there's a ton of content about Advent and every other liturgical season, um, all around faith formation from kids to adults and our e-formation learning community, which is about using uh, digital tools to um, sh share the gospel, build community, um, and enrich our lives together as a church and uh, sharing the gospel in the world. So we have a whole suite of websites and resources, so please do uh, check those out. Um, let me do uh, some introductions and share our contact information as well. So um, Sybil, Angela, and I are all pretty new to the webinar uh, experience. So I've been on a bunch of webinars for VTS, but I've never hosted one. It's my first time hosting. Uh, and uh, it's Angela's first time on a webinar, right? And Sybil, I don't know. Um, I think so. As well. So we're pretty new at this, but we think we've got it under control. Uh, <laughs> until everything goes haywire. <laughs> yeah, until something happens. Uh, but uh, this is a, these are our contact information for each of us, and we encourage you to be in touch. Uh, Sybil is the uh, author of the uh, beloved book, Praying in Color, that we just used actually for my confirmation class a couple weeks ago, uh, and also Season of the Nativity, uh, Confessions and Practices of an Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany Extremist. I love that. Uh, and uh, Angela is the Minister of Christian Education at the Church of the Holy Family in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is an Episcopal church, yes? It is, yes. Uh, um, but you're ordained in the Church of the uh, Nazarene. Yes. Which is cool. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, I'm the Associate for um, Digital Content at Lifelong Learning at an Episcopal Seminary, but I'm a Lutheran pastor. So we've got a whole mashup of identities and backgrounds here with us today. Uh, and so we'll share this at the end also with the contact information in case uh, people want to connect uh, based on something you've heard or that we've shared uh, today. Um, so this will be our format for the webinar. Uh, we like to break it up a little bit. So in the first part of the webinar, we're going to talk about big picture of Advent, some of the overarching themes uh, about it, and then we'll break for your questions and Q&A. Uh, then we'll do some practical resources, so we'll get really hands-on with lots of ideas, examples, and links. And all of those ideas and resources will be posted at Building Faith, which is buildfaith.org, um, within the coming week. So we'll have the slides, we'll have the video <coughs> recording, and we'll have all the links and information for you there. So you don't have to scribble all the way through the next 45 minutes together. Uh, we'll make that all available to you in the coming week. Um, and then we'll take your uh, Q and A's at the end mm -hmm. as well. So, and you can do that in the chat box. There's a chat button at the bottom of your screen, hit chat, and then you can write to us and I will field those as we go along. All right, um, good. And um, I'm going to pass it to Sybil to get us started. Okay, well, you said something about um, October is not too early. As an Advent extremist, I think it's always okay to talk about Advent, no matter what season of the year it is, because I really believe Christians are Advent people, and the season of Advent, which we talk about the preparation for getting ready for Christmas, uh, we think of it as the reenactment of people's longing for a Savior, and also our recommitment to, to be uh, a follow, follower of that Savior. So for me, it's never... Um, it's never not okay to talk about Advent because those things that we, you know, those delicious verbs that we associate with Advent, like prepare, wait, anticipate, pay attention, watch, hope, pray, repent, those are kind of the things we do all year long. And I, and I think what Ad Advent sort of taught me about spiritual practice, it taught me how to be an incremental Christian, I think, you know, that everything is a one day at a time 
kind of a, a practice. So it, for me, it's sort of the dress rehearsal for the whole year because, you know, if, you, if we think of Advent as the beginning season of the liturgical year, and I always imagine the liturgical year as kind of an oval, and that every year we re-enter, well, we, we can enter at any point, but Advent as the beginning, we, we walk, we rewalk the stories of salvation history. So we're revisiting our ancestors um, every year and to talk about the story. So we fill our backpack with practices and, um, that we do during Advent to take with us for the whole year. So, so it's a season of preparation and it's preparation for the coming of Christmas, but I also think of it as a preparation for being a pilgrim, uh, you know, and walking with God during the whole year. Um, I think the second thing I think of it, um, I think that uh, Advent is the season of the flesh. And that's the, 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 the uh, slide that says, um, there's, a, the sl uh, there's a slide that says that we talk about, this is the season of incarnation. And I think of the incarnation as being a capital I for the incarnation of Jesus. And it was God's willingness to meet us on our own turf, to become fully human um, as part of that paradox of also Jesus was fully divine. But I also think it's about our incarnation and our sort of being the image and likeness of God. And that's maybe little I in incarnation. And it's our willingness to be human and be embodied and be, you know, flesh and blood. Uh, I remember probably 30 years ago, I was, I lived in Painesville, Ohio, and I was driving on the highway back from Cleveland to Painesville, and I heard a Richard Rohr tape. And he said, evil or the devil, I'm not sure what word he uses, um, wins a great victory when we hate our bodies. Because if, if flesh was good enough for God, it ought to be good enough for us. And, you know, sometimes we hear that, uh, that something, I'm going to get this quote wrong about we're really spiritual beings or trying to be just kind of human, biding our time as human. To me, that's, that sets up that spirit flesh dichotomy. And I, and I really think it's, I really think it's both. And if, if, you know, if flesh was good enough for God, it ought to be good enough for me too. <laughs> and I need to stop hating my body, you know. I was talking to Angela and we were talking, I think women in particular, we're always hating our bodies. You know, there's always something wrong, whether it's our knees or our wrinkles or, and maybe, maybe men do that as well. Um, but, you know, I think it, we need to, that, that, and being such a, a season of the flesh, that it's also very sensory. And I love to uh, kind of surround myself with um, visual things that remind me that it's, Advent. And whether you use blue or whether you use purple, the, I, I happen to like purple, but, um, you I'm know, a purple fan. Something, pardon me? I'm a purple fan too. Oh, we had this. But, you know, it doesn't matter. There's reasons for using either one of those colors. But when I see something purple, it almost acts like a stoplight for me. Stop. It is not Christmas yet. Slow down. Wait. Um, you know, it's not time yet. And so I like to surround myself with the color. I like to surround myself with um, light. And I like to, I, I often do plants that are quick growers like Narcissus or the Amaryllis. And there's the fragrance of that. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a sensory time. It's a flesh time. It's a, it's a preparation time. And, and I think that the whole nativity season of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany gets what I say short shrift. I think Christians have made Lent and Easter the important seasons, you know, but we forget this other piece of it. If, if we just think that that's the important season, we're sort of uh, trying to get off the hook because I think, you know, we're supposed to be God's hands and feet on the earth. And so it's important to celebrate that. I, I was joking with somebody sometimes that, you know, the proclamation of faith and a lot of the Eucharistic liturgies is Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And I think we need a proclamation of the, of the epiphany, I mean, Advent, Christmas and epiphany, which I, I've been trying to noodle with. So I'm thinking Christ is longed for, Christ is born, 
Christ will spread like wildfire. Mm. And those are sort of the Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany sentences. They've not made it into any prayer book yet, but <laughs> they probably never will. I hear there's discussion, though, about revising it. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. So that's sort of my, my summary of the, of the Advent season. Preparation, flesh, and sense. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I, my task is to kind of talk about the lectionary texts and how they uncover the theological themes of Advent. And um, what I really like, Sybil, about what you've said is that you've really described Advent as a kind of like tension. And I think that describes our, the way that we exist at this point in history anyway, and especially what we experience during Advent. There's this sense that something has already happened. Christ has been born. We've received the gift of God incarnate in Jesus, um, and not yet. Um, like, Christ will come again. We're still waiting and longing for something. And so some of the themes that we find in Advent really highlight um, the reception of a gift and also the awaiting of a gift. It's not just a, you know, an historical remembering, but also something that we really are doing um, right now. Um, so I really like the way you describe it as a dress rehearsal, because mm -hmm. uh, it feels like that's the kind of, like here it's arrived and um, the, we have the play and it's in its final form, but you know, what is going to happen in the, the next part of the performance. Um, and I think along with the tension between already and not yet, there's the series of tensions that exist in Advent um, that are really present in the, the lections for the season. And those are, you know, between light and dark, between the first and last. Um, one that I really love kind of thinking about um, in Mary and Joseph's journey into Bethlehem is outside and inside. Who's in the community? Who's outside of it? Who um, has access to power and who's outside of um, power? And um, how does that kind of give us an interpretive lens? Um, and then watchfulness and longing, uh, joy and pain, all of those um, are really kind of present. Uh, so there are kind of two words that I think really encapsulate this the best, um, anamnesis and prolepsis. They're two of those like, you know, $5 words or $50 <laughs> words or whatever you call them. Um, and anamnesis that you are remembering, but it's more of an active remembering. Uh, bringing the past into the present and experiencing it as it's remembered. Um, and prolepsis is sort of like the other side of that, uh, bringing something that is for the future already um, into the present and anticipating it as though it's already happened. Um, that that is the kind of tension that we live in, um, you know, maybe all the time, but um, particularly in Advent, that we remember the birth of Christ and we anticipate uh, Jesus coming again. Um, and then would you move to the next slide? I have the four weeks of Advent have kind of four themes. This looks really clean. It's not that clean in <laughs> scripture, just like you might expect. It's a little messier. But I sort of, as I was reading through the lectionary text, um, sort of saw a few things emerge. And the first is, you know, in week one, we're asked to watch. And so, you know, the text in Jeremiah 33 begins with, the days are surely coming. Like, what's surely coming? I'm watching. Um, or Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 21, there will be signs. So you are to watch for what is um, going to happen. And that becomes a really strong theme in, in those lectionary texts. Our associate rector uses this um, sentence. We were both trying to pin it down exactly, but um, she couldn't remember. But I, I think I can recreate um, that Advent sort of as you, it doesn't begin where you expect it to. It begins with um, the sort of like apocalyptic storm cloud. Um, mm -hmm. I loved that image, this idea you, you enter on the first Sunday of Advent and you think, okay, we're on our way to inhabiting the mystery of Christmas and receiving the birth of the Messiah and of um, God in Christ. And then the first day is like, watch, beware, judgment is on the way. So there's, <laughs> <Hooray>. this, <laughs> there's this sense you're like, oh, that's, that's maybe not what I expected. Um, 
but the the storm cloud you know continues to grow and i i think there's something um about this theme of watch in the first week of advent it's it's you know given that we are in this tension between already and not yet that watch like you might miss it when jesus comes again you know um as as you've seen in the past uh it can happen in really surprising and unexpected ways and um what kind of surprising and unexpected way will it will will it be when you know christ comes again um and then week two we hear you know the story of john the baptist um prepare the way of the lord uh make make the highway in the desert um this this theme is kind of prepare and that's maybe a, even an expected theme um, in advent and then uh the third week um there's this really strong theme of trust the text in Zephaniah says do not fear do not let your hands grow weak the lord your god is in your midst trust mm -hmm. and then um the canticle assigned for that week uh, canticle nine from um, isaiah 12 surely it is god who saves me i will trust in him and not be afraid and then the philippians text um the second line of it from philippians chapter four says the lord is near do not worry about anything um, so that theme's really strong in there. Um, although, you know, the, the text from Luke chapter three, which is the gospel text for that week is it kind of unwinds a little, it's unclear if that theme is really present there. But, uh, what is interesting is that John says that Jesus is coming or the, the Messiah is coming and will baptize with water and the spirit. Um, and that made me sort of think about the connection between, um, our trusting that God works in our baptism to bring us into the household of God. And then the final, um, week four, you know, I said that these were sort of cleaner themes than are actually present in scripture. Um, and I could not pin it down to one. This is when we hear Mary, um, Mary's proclamation of the Magnificat um, to Elizabeth when she visits her after she finds out that she will um, give birth to um, to the Messiah. And we hear themes of expectation, of hope and joy. Um, expectation, hope and joy, you know, on an individual level, Elizabeth says that the child in her womb leapt for joy when she heard Mary, when it heard Mary's voice. And um, also hope and expectation, though, um, you know, about what this means for everyone that um you know the the lofty will be brought down and the rich are sent away empty um which is maybe a really interesting thing to hear during the fourth week um of advent right before we celebrate christmas which is just filled with things and richness that those are really kind of empty and the thing that we receive that fills us is actually uh, the you know receiving the gift of jesus so those were some of the themes that I saw in the lectionary um, and just the sense of longing that all shall be well. And yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's, uh, we, we'll take some comments or questions here and um, we'll see uh, if anybody has any questions that we can um, respond to here. Um, Let's see, anybody? I, I'll just make a comment that I, I think uh, those themes of Advent are, you know, like, I feel like we know so much about the world because we're so plugged in and we're just aware of, you know, there's just so little room for mystery and mm -hmm. wonder and like expectation because everything is just like so there and so immediate at our fingertips that um, there's like a, at first, like a discomfort about entering mm -hmm. into that Advent experience. Um, and then like a relief and a release. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, like, uh, like there's a, <laughs> there's kind of a blessing in the mystery of it, the unknowing mm -hmm. kind of, of it, the expectation of what's, what's coming next or mm -hmm. how will this Advent be different than last Advent? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm different because the world is different. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't, See there's any? A, I don't it see. Looks like there's a question down there. Is there? Um. Let's see. I don't see any. Let's see. Oh, haven't heard. Yes, thanks, Lou. Uh, haven't heard anything about Advent being the season preparing for the second coming of Christ. 
Ah. Um, so uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. So um, that, that I think is kind of what I'm, uh, you know, getting at with the watch and prepare. Um, watch Christ will come again. This is the second coming of Christ. And also the kind of tension between already and not yet. Um, the thing that is not yet is that we await Christ's final, re you know, return and final victory. Um, so. I like the idea that we are still actively waiting, but we don't, um, we don't just sit with, on our hands and wait for the coming of the kingdom when Christ will make it all right. That in some way we're also active waiters. So we're not just saying, okay, it's completely out of our hands and it's all just God doing it. On the other hand, it's, I hear people say, well, if anything needs to get done, it's just us that's going to make it happen. So I, I think it's the tension between knowing that everything we do can be God infused and that we're part of the, we're part of the bringing in the kingdom. I mean, like it's, it's our job to help do that in whatever way we can, knowing that we can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, but that we, we are sort of active waiters, active preparers, um, active imaginers of the kingdom and, and believers in, in the coming of that, of that kingdom. Mm. Uh, a couple more, a uh, few more. Thank you, everybody, for chiming in. Uh, Roberta just says the NT Wright's prepared some resources using the lectionary to focus on the second coming. Um, and if, uh, Roberta, you want to share that, uh, you can email me or share it in the chat or wherever, we'd love to pass that on to everybody following the webinar. Um, Lou says, uh, my concern is that we've sort of dumbed down Advent to be just getting ready for Christmas when it's more than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I know it's a, it's a short, Advent's a short season to begin with, and then, mm -hmm. you know, it's, then you have Christmas barreling down, and, you know, we're lucky, it feels like at our church, we're lucky if we get like a week of people's time and attention to think about Advent before they're psh, off. And in many ways, Christmas has been dumbed down. It's a day. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah. we think of it as the season of, of the birth. I mean, but it's very hard to try to do that on your own, you know, to continue the Christmas until the epiphany thing. It's that one day over tr Christmas, you know, tr Christmas trees on the tree lawn the next day because they've been up there since November 15th. Um, <laughs> so I think it's all, all that whole season has been dumbed down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife, who is Jewish, loves to decorate for Christmas super early, <laughs> like in November, She's pushing it earlier and earlier and earlier. So, you know. Sybil um, and I were talking earlier about how, given um, how short Advent is and also how countercultural it is, that there's almost this required season of preparation for Advent before you can... <laughs> use Advent to prepare for Christmas. So, uh, you know, I was saying that um, I try not to go into a shop, not to go shopping at all, um, except the grocery store during Advent, because it, you know, causes you to enter into the holiday frenzy and out of silence and waiting and um, hope and lament and, you know, the kind of tensions of the season. It just pushes you into Christmas and, and also wears Christmas out before it's even had a chance to arrive. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so Barb makes a comment. Uh, some of her colleagues have truncated the end of the church year, the liturgical year, to lengthen Advent as spiritual preparation. Um, and so is a longer Advent desirable? It's interesting. I had um, some friends who I think based on their ministry contacts with a lot of people that uh, like young adults who maybe gone, went away for the holidays, they, they actually had their Advent like starting in November. Uh, because then they were able to celebrate a full Advent, you know, before people took off, sort of. So, do you have any thoughts on expanding Advent, like lengthening Advent? But isn't there, there's like an actual move to expand Advent to 40 days, like Lent, right? There's, I think it's called 40 Day Advent. There's a website for it and everything. Oh. Uh, it's a common conversation among certain segments of young ministers, I guess. Um, I don't know. I think it would just require that we all have a kind of common discernment together. Uh, it seems to me that some of us entering Advent at a different time than others may not be ideal, but um, that if we discerned that that together, that that was a way forward, you know, that, that seems like a different thing to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have another question about connecting topics um, with the penitential spirituality of Advent. So that's a good question about um, the, the blue and the purple sort of, but like uh, there's a penitential quality uh, in ad, in ad, that has been a theme in Advent similar to Lent in terms of getting ready for this great holy day. Um, so you have thoughts about the kind of that penitential thread that runs through? Do you want to take that similar? Um, no, I just got messed up by something on the, on the computer. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that um, I've read before is talking about um, that, you know, Epiphany used to be celebrated as this major feast day, second only to Easter and Pentecost, um, and that Advent was also a time of preparation for baptism, and so it became, um, it was, you know, the, um, the season was already a kind of penitential season that was oriented around preparation for um, confession and baptism and entering back into church life after maybe being, um, you know, temporarily disciplined by a community. Um, and so I think that is definitely there. There's kind of what I, from what I understand, there's a difference between the kind of Western, um, you know, practice of Advent, which is, I think it's called like the warm Latin light or the joyful Latin light. Um, and then the Eastern kind of tradition, which would be much more in line with the kind of penitential sense of the season. Um, and then this isn't quite penitential, it's, but um, the kind of character of Advent really lends itself to the possibility for lament and truth telling about the state of the world. Um, mm -hmm. And those I think can really be a part of um, a penitential practice, um, you know, confessing the ways that we're complicit in the systems that are able to thrive in this time between the times. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It's sort of cor the corporate penitential. And then if we think of Lent as being your sort of personal. Mm. But I like that. I like the idea of the corporate. Well, I know we have some more questions, but we're going to hold on a couple, hold on to those questions until the end, because you guys have a lot of great practical um, things to share with us in terms of uh, tools and practices and resources to uh, reboot our advents this year. So um, I'll ask you to take us through some of those and then we'll have some Q&A at the end of this, this section as well. So Angela, I think you're going to do that. Oh, right. right. Yes. Sorry. I, um, I saw your slide and I just didn't want to make Sybil be the only one to recommend her book, <laughs> The Season of the Nativity. A couple of years ago, I bought one for every person in my family. Um, I don't, I didn't grow up in a liturgical tradition and um, I don't have family, extended family who are in liturgical traditions. And this was a really um, wonderful resource for inviting family members and also members of our parish who maybe were looking for ways to access the season of the nativity and kind of understand its internals and how it might be practiced and observed. A really great way to um, bring that in. This book is awesome. I love it. And it's a great gift um, to give to people. It invites us right into the middle of the story through a kind of sensorial um, approach. So, Thanks. So yeah. you're going to talk about some of the things that you recommend, right? Or you? I am. Yeah. You're first with this uh, thing on the, the our right hand of our screen. The oh. word map. Yeah. Oh, th well, that was just sort of a brain, a Got brain doodle about all the different <laughs> things. <laughs> oh, it's a mind mapping exercise about Advent. So mm. I love seeing all those themes in one place, though. Yeah, it's very cool. It's and I see like mystery and death and despair right alongside, you know, Messiah and Maranatha and coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things I think that Evan has done for me is I've always been a person of words and sort of praying in color came to me when I lost my words and the idea of images. I mean, I never thought that image would matter to me and it's become more and more important to me. And I'm not sure that, you know, I think uh, we've either overemphasized Im the words or we overemphasize images and th that it's a real meshing of both of those things. Um, mm. yeah. So it, it, as many different ways as we can 
talk about those things, whether it's in words or image, I think that that, that can be helpful. And it appeals to different kinds of learning styles too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, I, I put together a few resources for theology and themes. These are a lot around planning um, for liturgies or planning for events. Um, obviously, Sybil's book is really wonderful. And then- <laughs> I didn't um, care to say that. <laughs> no, no, she didn't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have this um, Advent source book. It's a collection of Advent uh, quotations and poetry, uh, just sort of things that you might find useful as you're planning. Um, and then two things that I use all the time. I, you know, you kind of collect this stuff when you work in the church, but some of it you just go back to over and over again. Uh, Living the Christian Year by Bobby Gross. He has a really awesome way of looking at Advent um, that you can check out. The book looks like this. And same with uh, Stuckey. He's just used um, all the time. These are just to kind of you know, they also are really great for other times of the church year as well. I use the handbook of the Christian year for worship planning. Um, I'm also an associate minister at a Nazarene house church in town. And so I use this for hymn selection and um, liturgy and stuff like that. Have the next slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. And then these are resources that you might use for events, programs, households, or the congregation generally. Um, I wanted to just point out two of them. I really like Advent Conspiracy because it reframes Advent and asks us to kind of just reconsider the holiday frenzy. I do think one of the things about Advent is that it's really, really counterculture, countercultural. It's this time when everyone else is, you know, playing Christmas music and spending all of the money and buying all of the things and, um, you know, finding the kind of joy of the season in that process and all of those things could are really wonderful some of those things are really wonderful and um, are fun to do um, and some of them help us enter into the awe and wonder of the season you know you can think of the kid walking into your living room on Christmas morning and their eyes are lighting up because the tree is really beautiful and there are gifts um, and they don't know where they came from. And, you know, maybe they know the story of St. Nicholas and that's really exciting. Um, but this asks us to really step outside of um, the kind of approach to Advent that's based in consumerism and um, making that what the gift of the season is. Uh, also asks us to consider simplicity and silence. Um, those are kind of picking up also on the penitential themes of Advent that we talked about a little bit. And then I use these calendars. I mean, I know that these are for the church year generally, but they're really helpful because Advent, of course, is the start of the Christian year. And so I'm a big calendar collector. My office is filled with I don't know, like 20 different kinds of calendars. Um, and I love this perpetual calendar from um, A Sacred Journey. And it just has information about each of the seasons and you switch it based on um, what season you're in. And in a similar vein, there's this Christian seasons calendar uh, that I, what I love about this is that it lays out the calendar by season as opposed to month. Um, and I think just, adding these things, you know, it's sort of like changing the colors in your Christian formation common room or in your home, you know, moving from green to purple, it sort of um, connotes a change that something different and new is happening and our attention should be shifted and focused. So there's some other things there. The Spotify pay playlist from Sacred Ordinary Days is really, really good. And they have it for all of the other seasons of the church year as well. So. Great. Great, and uh, all these will be available. The slides will be available. The links will be available on Building Faith. So we'll get this out to everybody so you can just click through um, and find everything. Be great. So um, I, I, there are a lot of practices that I love to do but during Advent, but I think my favorite one um, is doing an Advent calendar that where you actually do create the calendar. So. Often what I'll do, and these are free on my website, is I'll create a couple of templates. Um, and this one, last, this is from last year's. Um, sometimes I've just prayed for different people during Advent, but this time, and I, I just went back and looked, these were the words from Advent Word, which is, oh. wasn't that the VTS yeah. uh, thing last year? So every yeah. day I would 
uh, sort of sit and ponder that word and you know, just doodle around it. And I am, I am not an artist, so anybody can do this. If you can draw circles or lines or anything. Um, I didn't realize till I was finished that it actually looks like a swaddled baby. I thought I was just doing a, a window. Oh, wow. Ooh. But one of the things I like about this compared to uh, other advent calendars where you open it up and by the end it's kind of trashed, uh, I don't think of ad, I don't think of this as a count down to Christmas. I think of it as a count up to Christmas. <laughs> and when you look at the whole thing, it sort of is a record of your spiritual journey during that that whole season. And you you know you've got a bunch of words there. So um, there's another example of an advent calendar. Uh, the next slide. This is a, a my friend Cindy. Uh, makes a sort of a traditional calendar template every year and she can actually draw but <laughs> um, that's just another example often we'll have a uh, that kind of a regular calendar kind of uh, template on the website as well so um, let's well we, we should uh we should do one of those as part of advent we're this coming advent uh where people oh. we encourage people to take the words which are already right. circulating and and uh and do that so we should talk more about that yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, both um, Angela and I both like uh, Advent wreaths, and this this was just an attempt that I I'm such a klutz with this thing. You know those metal frames. If you look at the one up on the top right hand, I can do a metal frame, and it will look horrible afterwards. So most of the time, what I just do is just stick four candlesticks anywhere on the table or wherever we're going to have it, and then you know, put greens if you happen to have them. If you don't have greens, make paper chains. Or uh, the one up on the left was using a bunch of leftover candles from the previous year. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the things about, I mean, think Advent candles were often lit at meals. And a lot of times people don't share a meal anymore. So if, especially if you're a family, where, where does the family congregate? Maybe it's in the hall outside of the bedrooms before you go to bed and that you do whatever uh, practice around those that you want to do. Angela, do you have anything to say about Advent wreaths? Yeah, um, I in a minute I have another slide um, that talks about the different resources for it, but one thing that I wanted to say about this is, you know, in Advent we have this growing dark, and by the time we get to Christmas, all four of these candles, and if you have a central Christ candle, are a light, and, you know, the coming of the light into the world in the midst of the darkest time of the year. I think the connections between, you know, the natural world and what we're observing there and the Christian calendar in Advent are particularly strong. Um, you know, we often make a lot of connections between Lent and Easter and, you know, new life and all of that kind of stuff. I think the same sorts of um, parallels can really be made in Advent with the, the growing light and um, welcoming the light of the world into the world and receiving. Yeah. Him. I think one of the advantages of using an advent calendar at mealtime, if you have children and you actually can sit down to dinner, is that I've discovered that all of us behave better if we eat by candlelight. <laughs> <laughs> My child spends most of her time trying to blow the candles out. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what's the uh, next slide? Okay, this is sort of a participatory advent candle, I mean, advent wreath and advent calendar. So, you know, you can just stick four votive candles on a piece of paper and, you know, light the candle, but then add every day, add a little, have a child, or if you like to do this yourself, do it, you know, add a drawing, a sticker, whatever. So it's sort of a progressive advent wreath slash calendar, um, participatory. Um, and then the, what's the next one? Let's see. Next slide is, oh, okay, there's. You, these are some of the resources for Advent wreaths and devotionals that I've used. Um, I just see people ask, where do I get these metal wreath forms all the time? So they are linked here um, as well as candles, um, but I've also purchased them from other places. Um, there's devotionals from Candle Press, Nativity Story Cubes that you can buy or that you can make. And I'm going to add the illustrated children's ministry stuff here. They just came out with a ton of great stuff yesterday. And, you know, it, the other nice thing is that not, you know, their characters are not all represented as white people. So that's uh, really good and hard to find elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
the nativity story cubes here are just silhouettes. So that's why they work really well for that. But um, those are all really good resources. And I think they even have a set of Advent devotionals that I've given to our families in the past. I just, I package everything in a purple bag and leave it on the table for people to take out, usually with several different devotional uh, possibilities um, so that they can make decisions based on the age of members of their household. Great. So, yeah. Great. Um, one of the things I, I think it's important to do is to learn the cast of characters that are surrounding Advent, you know, like Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth. So one of the things I try to do is make up um, echo pantomimes. And um, a friend of mine named Roy DeLeon did the little pictures, but it's, it's like you say, uh, the leader says a sentence like, Zechariah was born, and then they say, Zechariah is born, and they do, or, or whatever the sentence is. And then they do an action that goes with it. And I found that ch children really like it, but adults really like to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And Angela, you've used this kind of thing, right? Yeah, so I was telling Sybil earlier that this was actually one of my favorite things in her book, um, because last year my daughter was almost three years old and she was kind of at a perfect age to begin listening to stories that were a little bit longer um, and also was you know ready to imitate and copy. So we did um, these during Advent and I, you also have it for the Magnificat in your book as well. So I think um, both of those were just really wonderful. And then I also have used these in our children's liturgy um, that happens during the service um, mm -hmm. and it works really well to do. And it. they're not hard to make up yourself really just yeah. to, I mean, not do the little drawings, but to, you know, to say a line, do an action, and then have somebody else repeat it. It's really not that hard to do. Yeah. So. And it certainly helps with retention. Yeah. So yes, I think so. The re yeah. repetition and the body movement. Yeah. Right. And it's the embodied thing again. You yes. Know? I, um, yeah. I tell our Sunday school teachers that when they learn stories, they should kind of know them in their bones. And so mm. this, I think, is one way of inviting teachers and students to kind of know that the story in their body mm -hmm. so kind of like what you're saying yeah. Yeah. yeah um another thing i like to do is have people sort of this is you can do this with the people in the book or advent words is have people uh and you know a certain level of kid could do this too but a, an adult is to uh, write a three sentence story about an advent word just take the word prepare, for example, because a three sentence story is a real nice short framework for doing something and you can do it for people or concepts or emotions or whatever. So, you know, this one says prepare and written, supposedly written by a child. My dad prepares and cooks dinner. He peels, chops and sautés vegetables and olive oil. It takes patience and time and attention to prepare yummy meals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you can also, <laughs> you know, tweets have gotten a bad reputation sometimes, but <laughs> you, you know, do the same, same idea with a word and write a tweet about it. And, and when they come out, reading them out loud in a group for a, a Christian education group, they almost end up being poetic because there's a limited amount of, of words and it's really, it's really a fun exercise, I think. Cool. Okay. Um, and then here's the, uh, you know, the living advent uh, calendar is to plant, uh, these are narcissus bulbs or amaryllis bulbs. And, you know, just for, especially for children, it's like an exercise in watching and waiting. And a young child can water them every day. But it's sort of like watching and waiting, but not waiting in vain, because you manage to see what's, what's happening. Mm. So I like the living the living advent uh, calendar as well. And then next one, um, this is about uh, the visual, the three minute egg timer. Uh, I think children, you know, invited to go make, create a little corner and say, hey, for three minutes, I just, you know, you can sit in the dark with the candle and uh, see if you can be quiet for three minutes. So it's sort of an, rather than saying, go sit in that corner and be quiet, it's like, Give them something, you know, a, dark, a little dark corner and a, and a timer, which they can actually see mm. the, the grains go down. So mm. um, our worlds are as busy and crazy as ours. So. 
so I included a couple of slides of children's books that I often use. Um, the two that I'll just point out from this slide are um, Look by Laura Lari. This came out, I think, last year awesome. and we awesome. used it. What I love about this book is that it makes connections between practices in church and what kids are going to see in church with um, the rhythms of the natural world and also the you know stories in scripture that are kind of being highlighted by the lectionary during that season. And then the other one, um, because it's one of my favorites, is this uh, book of poems by, um, well, it's compiled, um, and then the illustrations are done by Helen Can, who just does a really tremendous job, but they're all poems from the perspective of animals in the um, main, you know, in the manger, but I, I know the animal thing can be a little overdone during Advent, but it's just really beautifully done, and I think invites us to just consider, um, you know, the historical moment of it. And then I think there is um, another slide of books here. Um, yeah, these are just some books that I've um, used in my house. I, I'll say again, just that, you know, most of these represent characters that are um, represented as white. And I think that is um, something that's like a challenge to us. We really need to come up with more books. But these are um, books that I've used in the past. I really like using Bias for Bethlehem because it has some of the historical context that um, a lot of the other books um, lack, you know, when you get into it for children. Mm -hmm. Oop, I think I went by one. There we are. So that's just another example of, a, of an advent calendar. If you, you know, make a little uh, clothesline and then have somebody in the family or in a church, however you want to do it, uh, every day write, you know, decorate or whatever you want to call that on the, on the little envelope. And, and it's a way to add all the change lying around the house or add a dollar. And at the end, as you as a family, at the end of advent can, can decide where you would like that money to go. Hmm. Great. Um, and I think we're, we're at uh, another time for questions and comments. So um, I know we have had a couple, we've got some chats and we've got some Q and A's here. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, sorry, well, somebody just asked as a little housekeeping thing, um, will the content be emailed to you later? And yes, uh, because you're registered for the webinar, anybody registered for the webinar receives an email with all the information and content. So we will make sure that we, uh, we do get that to you. Um, let's check the, let's see. Do you have ideas, um, Nan uh, writes, uh, do you have ideas that will engage adults versus children? Or uh, I'm not sure if that's kind of inter an intergenerational question or um, ways of engaging ad adults as well. But I think a lot of the examples you use, Sybil, um, even though we often associate coloring with children, it can be really profound with adults as well. I would agree. I would say most everything that I suggest that can be done with adults as well as as mm -hmm. well as children. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, a Barb asks, is that mind map that you shared about Advent, the one that was next to the book cover, is that right. in in the book or a separate exercise? Um, it's in it's in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's also the way I kind of do Lexio Divina, too, so it, or other, other ways, but it was sort of the beginning of a Lexio or Lectio, however you say that, um, about Advent. And, um, yes. uh, and do you have uh, suggested Advent craft resources, places to go that you like for crafts? Some of those are on some of the slides you shared, Angela, but any other thoughts or suggestions? I've really liked a lot of the things I've seen out of um, Flame Children's Ministry, which is one of the links that I included for the Nativity Story Cube. That's actually a, something that you can make um, instead of purchasing. So I think they have a lot of really great stuff, some sensory bins and baskets, uh, story bags, um, all of those have kind of a crafting element to them. Um, you know, like any formation minister, a, Pinterest uh, is a really big opportunity or a big uh, place. I think, Sybil, your blog has some stuff too, right? Right, especially during Advent, I try to put some. <laughs> I bet. But I'm not, I'm not big into crafts, so I can't yeah. 
is a craft. I mean, the craft. yeah, Except if an advent wreath is a craft. <laughs> yeah. And I would say I'm kind of more into the sensory experiences than like a prefabricated craft kind of thing. So I've used some of the ideas I've seen elsewhere, but flame has really, really good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. um, some, uh, somebody says, uh, we traditionally have a Thanksgiving event, dinner or dessert, and I would like to change that to a beginning for Advent. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Hmm. I'm not sure exactly, but Advent really, I think part of the slip, part of the reasons Advent sneaks up on you is it's right after the big Thanksgiving holiday oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So like Advent one is Thanksgiving weekend and people may be away or distracted. And it's sort of like, sometimes by the time you get into Advent, it's you're like Advent two between before people are tuned in. You know, I have a fantasy of having, I don't know whether it's a whiteboard or a huge board in a, in a congregation and giving people like post-its or, or something to, uh, to post on there, not, you know, not every day, obviously, but, or, or once a week or whatever, that would see, be sort of like a huge advent calendar. And that's sort of, I mean, something you could start after a Thanksgiving dinner or as a, maybe an advent dinner. That's a nice idea though, I don't know. <laughs> something to think about, right? Just make them wait and wait for the food and get very expectant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this year, our uh, parish is doing a, a crush event where people are bringing their crushes, uh, I think right before the first Sunday, I don't know the calendar, you know how it is, I'm a little out of the place right now, but um, they're bringing crushes that maybe they've received as gifts throughout their life or picked up on their travels. Um, their family crush and then writing out small, you know, index card size narratives of where it came from and what the story is behind it. Um, and that I think we're doing right before Advent to kind of usher in the season. Mm -hmm. People might bring like a special food or whatever for the, their table. Yeah. Um, Carlene says that uh, she's had at her church, people reenact the scripture each week. So one somebody dresses as John the Baptist and says, prepare the way, or Mary singing the Magnificat in costume, mm -hmm. and it helps to bring the scriptures to life. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Well, uh, and something we didn't talk about at all are Christmas pageants, which are, you know, oh, yeah. really, really big in Advent. And there are a bunch of resources that I was reading the last few days on the Building Faith blog that, you know, so lots yeah. of ways to act out scripture and bring it to life. Yeah, we just published a roundup of uh, different, has, has scripts oh, of different nice. pageants. And uh, so it's, it should be on the Building Faith uh, homepage now. And that's also a kind of a resource. If you go in, you'll find uh, seasonal resources and ideas very practically oriented. So that could also uh, serve as a resource. Um, somebody says, uh, Beth says they've done a nativity museum, uh, similar mm -hmm. to what you're suggestion, suggesting. Um, they've had intergenerational Advent adventures to help resource people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Adventures. Adventures, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody, uh, Marlene says they do an Advent dinner on the first Wednesday of Advent, a meal followed by assorted crafts that include versions of Advent wreaths, tree decorations, uh, one to decorate our tree, one to take home, and take home resources for families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At my church, we've done, um, we call it a Advent eco fair, where uh, people come in and we have like a little devotional thing. And then they have all these crafts and activities that are all from uh, reclaimed or recycled materials mostly. Oh, that's so we've, cool. we've had like a green team that's done that. And so um, kids make all kinds of little different things and it's kind of intergenerational because the adults are help, helping them guide them through the, yeah. through the crafts. That's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, and Kara, Kara says, uh, Kara, Kara, sorry, uh, says uh, that when they do their crash displays, um, people bring them in from around, you know, when they've collected them from around the world, mm -hmm. and it helps to portray non-white images of Jesus and the Holy mm -hmm. Family. Yeah. So that's also a nice way because the, the resources and the images are very limited mm -hmm. uh, in that regard for Advent, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. I think... Uh, uh, we knew we were going to go over time, but then we had our technical difficulty <laughs> on top of that. Over time. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to share the slide with 
uh, everybody again with our contact information. Um, and uh, these are some ways that you can get a hold of us. And um, we thank everybody for tuning in and sticking with us. We had a, you were all there when we came back. There's something spiritual about that. And, uh, <laughs> and we've, we've stayed strong with the kind of the people have been able to stay with us over the course of this hour, despite our technical difficulties. Um, but we'd love to hear from you, love to hear your ideas. And uh, we've enjoyed talking about Advent over the past week or two when we've been preparing this and planning this. And uh, it's uh, gotten a lot of creative juices flowing for me, for sure, thinking about my own parish work and uh, looking ahead to Advent. So please be in touch with us and we'll be in touch with you. Since you've registered for the webinar, you'll automatically get notifications of the content and all of the, the video, the slides, uh, and all the links and resources will be available at Building Faith in the coming week. And you'll just be able to, to access them all there. And uh, Angela and Sybil, thank you so much for yeah, thank you. doing this webinar okay. and sharing your passion for Advent and all of your great ideas. Like it's incredible. Uh, I feel so, like in my as my, with my pastor hat on, I feel like so equipped, <laughs> uh, much better equipped to think creatively about how we uh, observe Advent this year. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, well, thank you everybody for tuning in, and um, we'll see you on uh, uh, future webinars from uh, Lifelong Learning at VTS, and uh, check out our Building Faith site as well, where you'll have this and uh, other resources for Advent. Okay. Peace. Peace. Peace.